Okay. How are those, uh, how are those cookies? Good? Yeah? I'm glad they paired it with milk. Don't want no dry mouths here. Um, to say that I am, I'm pumped for this uh, kind of next collection of talks is an understatement. I'm really pumped to kind of be camping in this umbrella of topics for the next month-ish. Um, a new series called You in Five Years. <clears throat> and I hope you can be around for the entirety of it. And this is why I'm excited for it. Honestly, I wish, um, I wish someone taught me this in my early young adult years. And now, I, I, I do gotta say, like, I, I was blessed, I had mentorship, I had wisdom, I had guidance. But if I could have learned this at a young age, it would have really set me up for like bigger success in my, in my early 20s that can be rampant still in my you know, late 20s and still today in my own life in my early 30s. And what I, the big question throughout this um, series is this is what do you want your life to look like in five years? What kind of things do you want instilled in your life by the year 2028? What could God, now if you're here and you are not, not a believer or a Christian, that's all good, glad you're here. We're gonna take a look at this through a Bible lens, but what could God do through you and in your life bringing out greatness in the next half a decade? Because we call this series you in five years rather than you next year because we tend to overestimate what we can do in one year and underestimate what we can do in five. So what could you do in five years? On a practical sense, I I just kind of thought about this, jot this down, talked to some people, and I, I jotted a few things down. You, in five years, you can learn a new language. On top of that, you'll be fluent in a new language. It, with things uh, with like Rosetta Stone, Duolingo, YouTube, you can take advantage of that. And so if I wanted to in five years, I could be, I could be speaking in conversation in a completely different language. Here's another one. You can, you can master a sport. If there's something that piques your curiosity or interest, if you want to take up running, you could easily run a marathon or even an Ironman in the next five years. It starts with small steps and strides and so on and so forth. You could take up fencing. Hey, I don't know if that's your jam, but you could end up in the Olympics. And it's not too late, just in 2021, there was a man who was 45 years old who was on the Argentina basketball team. He could do it. Back in the early 1900s, there was this guy named Thomas Scott who was in archery and he was 71 years old. So don't tell me it's, it's too late. You, you can get a degree. If your life right now is not giving you the passion that you're, that you're striving for, of course, there's another financial weight to it. But in reality, you can go be in school and get back onto a path of a passionate life in less than half a decade. You could read 60 books in five years. For some, that's nothing. For some of you guys, that's a lot. But that averages out to a book a month, and that averages out to about, you know, reading 10 to 15 minutes a day. Not hard. It's just about starting. With saving and making farts financial, uh, smart financial decisions, you can own a house. Like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> smart. But fart, just for those who wanted to hear it. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, you could. You're ruining my groove here, guys. But, in, you know, in half a decade with some, with some hard work, farts, and stuff like that, you could be having one of the most greatest financial assets in your life. See, the ways you let in becomes the ways you get set in. And September is a time that we naturally are in that state and that subconscious season where we reevaluate things and, and we, we think to ourselves, how can I make myself better? And then we implement those decisions to help us be better. But I think the mistake a lot of us make is that we shrink that down to such a small period of time where we can't possibly see the long-term impact in just one year. And I know this might be a tough pill to swallow for a lot of us in this room, but the reality is, is that a lot of us in this room are, are, still like, are still like children, thinking like children, acting like children. I don't mean that in an offensive way. I'm, I'm just saying a lot of us think about only the here and now. About, about the fads, the trends, the quick fixes, the immediate results, things like that. So what could happen in five years with compound interest? What kind of greatness can come out of you in the next half a decade? Now, talk like that is cheap, but, and I don't know everyone in this room specifically and personally, but I can say this with full confidence that everyone in this room has a God-given potential. 
There's this God-given greatness inside of you. Whether you are a believer here or not, you are valuable. You, are, you have a destiny. You have a calling, and you have a purpose. There is the image of God inside of you. So how do we become great by 2028? And this is kind of like a part one to part two. So next week, come back next week so you can get the full circle of the entirety of the message. But I want to read from the Bible. And this is specifically from the book of Psalm chapter 90. Now, fun fact, this is the oldest psalm in the Bible. And if you are new to church, the book of Psalms is a book full of songs that are meant to be sung as worship towards God. And they exude every type of emotion out there. And this is what the Bible says in the book of Psalm chapter 90. It says, Lord... Through all the generations, you have been our home. Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from beginning to end, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. For you, a thousand years are as a passing day, as brief as a few night hours. You sweep people away like dreams that disappear. They are like grass that springs up in the morning. In the morning it blooms and flourishes, but by evening it is dry and withered. We wither beneath your anger. We are overwhelmed by your fury. You spread out our sins before you, our secret sins, and you see them all. We live our lives beneath your wrath, ending our years with a groan. Seventy years are given to us. Some even live to eighty. But even the best years are filled with pain and trouble. Soon they disappear and we just fly away. Who can comprehend the power of your anger? Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. Teach us to realize, listen to this, the brevity of life so that we may grow to, in wisdom. O oh Lord, come back to us. How long will you delay? Take pity on your servants. Satisfy uh, uh, us each morning with your unfailing love, so we may sing for joy to the end of our lives. Give us gladness in proportion to our former misery. Replace the evil years with good. Let us, your servants, see you work again. Let our children see your glory. And get this last line. And may the Lord our God show us his approval and make our efforts successful. Yes, make our efforts successful. Now, you are reading here the oldest psalm in the book, like I mentioned before, and also, like I mentioned before, is a book of songs sung as worship towards God, and primarily the authorship is a guy by a guy named David, King David. But he didn't write every single psalm, including this one, and this one is the only one written by a guy named Moses, hence why this is probably the oldest psalm out there. And just a little re a recap, just to give you some context on how this song came to be, because each psalm is written in response to a triggered moment in history, okay? So let me just give you a little bit of recap here so you understand a little bit of context. Moses was the one who listened and obeyed to God to take on Pharaoh in a duel and be the one to set the Israelites free from captive and slavery from Egypt, Moses beats Pharaoh with extraordinary miracles. They cross the Red Sea, which is an extraordinary miracle of itself. They, and then all of a sudden, he is now leading two to three million Israelites through the wilderness. So they go on this journey, and they take a pit stop to Mount Sinai. And if you don't know, it's a mountain where Moses goes up, grabs the Ten Commandments, and brings it down towards the people. Now, from Mount Sinai, God has taken him to a journey to what we call the Promised Land. That is God's promise. He's saying, I'm going to deliver you from captivity, and you're going, uh, going to go towards this land. God describes as the land of milk and honey, just pure goodness on display. Now, the journey from the Mount Sinai to the promised land, get this, if you straight shoot it, it's an 11-day journey. An 11-day journey. And so as we're creeping up towards the promised land, Moses sends 12 spies. He says, go check it out, see what we're up against. Ten of them comes back. And they say, oh, Moses, I don't know, like their voice is crackling. Like there's giants there, they're big and they're huge. And, and the Bible says we look like grasshoppers compared to them. And then we have two, jo uh, Joshua and Caleb. And they're the two out of the 12 that says, well, of course there's giants there. It's the land of milk and honey. It's pure goodness on display. Of course the giants will want to live there. But here's the thing. We have God on our sides so we can take them out. God was with us and he was faithful with Pharaoh. God was with us when we crossed the Red Sea. He was with us giving us food every single day in the wilderness. And he is going to take care of us now. But the ten are like, yeah, well, like, they're just really big and stuff. And, and Moses listens to the ten, and disregards the two. And so what ends up being an 11-day journey, friends, 
It ends up being a 40-year wandering. 40 years. Because God is like, listen, the choice is yours. But because of your unbelief, none of you from your generation will be able to see and inherit the promised land. And now this, these, these Israelites are going on the, the world's worst road trip. Just going 40 years in circles and in circles and in circles. And it was at this moment that Moses wrote this song. We see hindsight into Moses realizing he's not going to be the one who's going to see the promised land. And he writes a song, and the song is birthed out of that. God's annoyance that he has given us everything, and we don't, we don't step into it. Moses now has a full 360 picture here and now. Too late, but nevertheless puts it in towards a song. Well, now that's a great historical lesson, Rubes, but how does that how does that apply to me and to us today? Well, on the contrary, it has huge implications. Because as Christ followers, we are now stepping into this new world and this figurative promised land, meaning all that God has for us. And a lot of us, even though we've left Egypt, a lot of us in this room still has Egypt not left them. God wants us to step into this promised land, and that's why it says in the book of Ephesians, See all that we're open to in Christ. So you can be saved, thus not going to hell, sure. But forget that you have a calling on your life to do great things for heaven here on earth. There's a lot of people going towards eternity with a saved soul, but will get there and realize all too late that they just wasted a life. Potential, calling, greatness all those types of things, and they never had that greatness inside of them released. So all I'm trying to say to you is don't die with your song still left inside of you. Don't let your story, just you be wandering in circles for years. Oh, it's just another year. Oh, it's just another decade. But to inherit, receive everything that God has for you, it's time for this young, young adult generation to step up to step up in their calling and receiving all God has for you. Because once that is received, oh boy, there's nothing. There's nothing stopping this generation of what you can and cannot do. Now, all this stuff can't happen in the day. To picture yourselves in five years and what you want to look like, that can't happen in the day. But to quote this famous leader named John Maxwell, he says, this type of change cannot happen in a day, but they can happen daily. Taking it one step at a time, a little bit at a time. And so we hear, we, we have the readers, us, reading and listening to Moses' song here, and we kind of eavesdrop on Moses' uh, behind-the-scenes thinking here, and, and Moses is trying to tell us something. He's trying to tell us, hey, life is racing by. And through Moses teaching us a few things, and the first thing he wants us to know is, time is not on your side. Time is not on your side. When we make it a goal to invest into ourselves in the next five years. It'll be up on the screen there. It, it, we're not going to look up and peek and see what's going on just after a year. Now remember, we're going to be on this journey, okay, for the next five years. This is who you're going to be. But a lot of us are consumed by the distractions. We want to see the immediate results. Some of us are distracted by what Moses calls the flower. See, um, he says in a, in a song, like, life just springs up like green grass. It's just, life just springs up like a beautiful flower. Just when we're about to enjoy it, it's gone. And that's how it is with everything in life, man. Oh, I can't believe Christmas is creeping up again. I can't believe my birthday is just around the corner again. Like, I know people still get minor PTSD when we talk about it, but it's, it's been three and a half years since the pandemic started. And I remember just like this morning, I was worrying and suffocating myself through a face mask. But <clears throat> in reality, in hindsight, time has flown by. It's been a long time. And that's what it will be like for the rest of your life. Here one moment gone the next. Someone took an entire 24-day <clears throat> from midnight to midnight, and a lot of these life events threw it. They said birth is midnight, obviously, and then took death to the next midnight. They took an average life expectancy and broke it down in a clock format. And now, of course, it's different from men and women, but let's just take an average here. It says birth, birth is at midnight, Okay. And if you are 10 years old today, then it's 3 a.m. By the time you celebrate your 20th birthday, it's 6.24 a.m. At 30, 
it's 9 a.m. At year 40 of your life, it's basically high noon. At 50, it's 318, and at 60 years old, it's 622 p.m. And now you got like five hours and 38 minutes to live. (laughs) What's the point? The point is that time is not on your side. The biggest danger you can fall into as a young adult, listen to me, is the luxury of you thinking, oh, I'll get to that. I knew, I always knew I had a special call in my life. Or I always knew I had this dream on, on me, and, or I always knew I was supposed to be doing that, or I always knew I was supposed to be participating in that. Friends, your whole someday is never going to come. Because there will always be a reason for you to dismiss the potential growth in your life. But what you do have is you have today. You have today to make a conscious decision to take one step forward in this journey towards greatness. The second thing Moses wants us to know is that future you is an exaggerated version of current you. Future you is an exaggerated version of current you. You know, I find it funny when we think about the future. It's like we romanticize it a little bit. It's like, oh, I can't wait to like see what I'm like when I'm older. I can't wait for my five-year glow up. Like, it's just you, but more amplified. What do I mean? Like, if you're kind today, you'll be kind then. These things deepen. These things mature. If you're generous today, you'll still be generous in five years. If you're cruel today, you'll still be cruel in five years. If you're a jerk today, don't, don't, not fun to hang around with, well, guess what? In five years, still the same thing. Because all these things just grow and they deepen and, and, they, and they, they soak and seep into the crevices of your life and they eventually shape and form your character. Time does not change who you are. It reveals who you are. It makes you more of who you are. Time isn't going to change you, friends. Like, oh, I'm just going to be different in the future. No, you're exactly like you are today making the choices today. You're just going to be more set in those ways. This is what it says in Proverbs 11, 27. If you search for good, you'll find favor. But if you search for evil, they'll find you. So if you earnestly seek good, and that's what you're doing, Like, you're looking for the good in people. You're looking for the good in situations. You're looking for the good in life. You're living life with this faith-filled optimism. Well, guess what? The older you get, you're going to start to see that favor reciprocate itself into your life. And that will just kind of develop into this tangible fruit. But if you're seeking trouble and evil, like, you're like one of those people who just sees the, 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 the bad and all the problems in every situation. Or you're the first person to see the faults in other people. Well, all that kind of stuff is just going to boomerang back towards you. All these famous quotes and ideologies people have said over the course of history. You are what you eat. You become what you watch. You, you know, you reap what you sow. All those things have been derived from the Bible. And that has been the source All these self-help books, all the stuff the authors are quoting and giving to you is all coming from the Bible. So, future you? I guess it's not so mysterious after all. It's just you, but just exaggerated. Unless you make a change. Unless you make drastic action. Which leads me to my next point. If you don't like what you're getting, change what you're doing. If you don't like what you're seeing in this figurative mirror as you're heading down towards this, this five-year journey, then something just has to change, and which makes Galatians 6, 7 so crucial and important to consider. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. See, a lot of us think that we can sow into the flesh and sow and appease our own desires and then all of a sudden reap life. Doesn't work. It's like planting apple seeds and then all of a sudden expecting some other kind of fruit like watermelon. And that's how that we're actually expecting life to be, even as a Christ follower. Like we're just thinking, oh, it's okay. God's going to come and he's going to bless it and override it. But just like Moses wrote in the song, he says, God, we want your blessing, but we want you to bless us as we establish our ways in a way that will please you. I am so grateful. 
I'm so grateful for, for, for the project and you guys. I'm so grateful for, for me and you to be here in September 2023 and have this wake-up call and have this come-to-Jesus moment and project ourselves in the future and perhaps maybe not like what we're seeing, but we're going to do something about it. Friends, it's time to sow different seeds. It's now time to reap what Jesus has called life. As young adults and a generation that has so much potential, you in this room, it is time to live in a way in such a way that our future selves will thank us when we get there. Because we put into motion the small things over time that can help us arrive at that greatness God has for us in 2028 and even beyond. And so the last thing I want to end with tonight is ongoing consistency is much more important than the short-term intensity. And so whether you're familiar with the parable of the sower or not, the idea is straightforward. See, the seed that is sown and shot up really quickly has no roots. The analogy is that it's going to fall really quickly when it hits temptation and hardships in life because it has no security, it has no roots. But that little, easily despised growth in good soil, it may not look much like much right away, but it has the power to, to lead to 30, 60, even 100 impact over time. Now hear me, I'm not going to shame anyone for their past. God knows I have a past and I, that's something I never want to look back at again. I'm with you. But can't today's time be a time just to turn the page into something brand new? Can't today be the day for you saying, hey, I know I made some mistakes last year. I know I made some mistakes last month, last week, heck, even yesterday. But today I want to make that conscious decision to move forward in all that God has for me. And that I would take these little by little small steps of consistency and not wrap my head around the intensity about doing it all in one day or all in one week, but actually take the time to see the unleashed power of compound interest. Compound interest is something that Albert Einstein has defined as the eighth wonder of the world. This is a direct quote from him. Albert Einstein says, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it. He who doesn't pays it. This is a whole lot of difference. There's a whole lot of difference between, you know, having 19% interest that you are paying and 90% um, interest that you are earning. Now, all of us have probably grown up with playing tomato, do, tomatoes. Dominoes at some point in their life. If you have not played dominoes, come see me after. I'll give you a big hug. And probably this set if you wanted, huh? It's nostalgic to me playing dominoes growing up, and even better yet, other than actually playing the game, it's fun just to kind of stack them up like this. Oh, I was toppled all over. It's fun to kind of stack them like this and just kind of push them forward and see. I'm, I once made a domino line that was like 50 feet long. It was fantastic. Only lasted four seconds, but hey. It was worth it. Now, a lot of us as young adults, we understand the, just the power of just sheer force and gravity and the power of momentum. And theoretically, like if I just push this domino, the gravity and the initial force and momentum would allow the dominoes to make all these other dominoes fall, right? So if I touch this, boom. Wow. It's been debated over time, but a scientist once realized that every domino that falls, as a matter of fact, doesn't have that initial force to topple down another thing its own size, but it has the power to topple down another object its size and a half. Because of gravity and momentum and the laws of motion and whatever it is, I don't, I don't understand. Albert Einstein stuff. That with initial force, that domino has the power to, to topple over not only itself, but something 50% bigger than itself. It's a crazy thing like that, right? That this, this, small, this small little block here, if you topple it over domino style, has the power theoretically to topple over the next bigger one, the next bigger one, so on and so forth. And that small tic-tac-sized domino has the power to topple over that big pillar there. And we counted this 10 times. But with the power of compound interest, if we were to count up to 29 times, you will now hit the size of the Empire State Building. 
welcome to compound interest. This is what C.S. Lewis once said. He said, good and evil both increase at compound interest. So not only do these forces work for us for good, but that force can work against us as well. The question is, which direction do you want to unleash that power? For good or for evil? For the spirit or for the flesh? For light or for darkness? There's this illustration that comes from Australia where <clears throat> these doctors put two groups of 100 people in this study for four and a half years. And they told one group, hey, you're going to wear outside sunscreen SPF 50 anytime you think you're going to have a lot of exposure to the sun. So if you think you can go to the amusement park, if you think you can go have a beach day, if you know you're going to be like gardening for four hours, then put SPF 50. He says to the other group, what I want you to do is every single day, I want you to wear SPF 15. Not 50, 15. So whether you're inside all day, whether it's raining outside, whether you're not going to get any exposure to the sun whatsoever, I still want you to put on the SPF 15. At the end of the four and a half years, the study showed these incredible results, how the first group that was wearing SPF 50, and when you put the before and after picture up, there's just a, such a massive difference in terms of just aging. But yet, when you put the before and after picture of those who are wearing SPF 15 for every single day for four and a half years, there's barely a difference. And so you can see where I'm going with this, but <clears throat> what's true for your skin, yeah, and that illustration makes sense, is also true for your soul. My mom kept, te kept teaching me, Reuben, the word of God is meant to be bread for daily use, not cake for a special occasion. I think she was onto something there. Mainly because she didn't want me to eat cake all the time. We don't get to choose what life we will get born into. So what is the life you get stuck with? No matter what kind of hand you've been dealt with, by the end, it's the life that you make. As we move into something called, uh, something called worship in response, I'm not sure if, you can, if you've noticed, but I have these cards and these little pencils. There's four stacks, one here, one here, one here, and one there. I wanted this to be a moment where we, we actually took tangible action. My heart in coming towards a project, I've been here for over a year now, and it's a blessing to work with people like Jeff and Brett and Abby. But my heart, my burden, is to see a young adult generation that have chosen to accept Jesus, not just accept Jesus just so we can go to heaven after we die, but to see heaven on earth while we live. It's powerful, a powerful generation with so much potential in this room to step up to the plate and set, and set the standards to where society and the cultural norm goes against what the church says. But the Bible says that you would actually live it out. And listen, you have so much potential, you guys, like unreal. And in five years, I would love to see you one day just make such an amazing impact for God's kingdom. But it starts today. It starts by taking a, a, a piece of paper, if you want to. I'm not going to force anybody. Take a piece of paper and write down, hey, what are some things I want instilled in my life in five years? And maybe for you, it's something surface level. Like, oh, it's not surface level. I don't mean in a bad way. But like something practical. Like, oh, I want to be done school. Or I want to own a house. Or I want to have this much savings in my account. Sure, I'll give it to you. But I'm going to ask you to go deeper. Maybe, oh, in five years, I want to, you know, maybe read the Bible cover to cover twice. Or I want to I want to understand scripture a lot more. Or I want to be able to do this, this, and this. The ball's in your court. You, and, and the sky's the limit here. And so what I want to do and is, is to, as a matter of fact, this is just step one. And by the end of the series, I'm going to, you know, we'll, we'll do something on October 1st. And if you want to, we can like write a letter to ourselves, our future selves in five years. And we'll keep your letter in, a, in, in an envelope and we'll mail it to you in five years. So it gives you an idea. Oh my gosh. Some of you will be super encouraged. Some of you will be so sad. <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I'll, I'll explain that again as, as the weeks come close towards October 1st. But for right now, this is, this is a first uh, stepping stone um, for you guys. And so... Um, 
I'm going to pray and, and, and worship is going to happen. And I'm going to invite you to stand right now actually with me. I'm going to pray over you. And, um, I'll, I, and then remember, this is part one. Part two is going to come full circle next week. Um, we're going to talk about just choices we make um, next week. But for now, like, this is a great starting point. So, like, okay, during worship, you guys can come up at any time, grab a piece of paper and grab a pencil. And, and while you're standing during worship, just write down, hey, I want, I want to instill this in my life. I want, to, I want to learn to grow. I want to practice this. And this is a decision that you and I can make today. And we're never too young. We're never too old to understand what God has in store for us. And so would you journey with me on that one? That we can see this, this, this beautiful young adult generation not be so enclosed and, and only have this hoorah moment on Sunday nights, but have this unleashed generation to make an impact, those in universities to make an impact in your schools, those in the workforce to make an impact with your coworkers, and so on and so forth. Let me pray for you. And once worship begins, when I say amen, whenever you feel comfortable, if you feel comfortable, come on up, grab a piece of paper, and let's do our thing. Thank you, Jesus, for our time together, and thank you for the project. Thank you at your hands upon every single young adult here in this room. And we just pray that uh, this is not a, a talk or a topic that's meant to be sealed or closed or forgotten, but something to be maybe practiced, processed, and applied to our lives. And so in Jesus' name, we just pray for every single young adult that they would you know, have a moment of realization. It's like, wow, who do I want to look like in five years? And God, I hope the prayer that everyone has in this room is resonating as a common denominator that we want to look more like you. We want to deepen our faith. We want to mature our faith. We don't want to have this wishy-washy faith where we love you only on Sunday nights, but love you 24-7. And so in Jesus' name, we pray protection over our young adults. We pray a blessing and anointing and this, this, this push and fervor to live a passionate life. And not just this passionate life just for a week, but a passionate life that will go throughout the ages. And as we look, uh, as we get older and look back in hindsight, we realized that there's not the stack of regrets but there's a stack of accomplishments and faith and leaps of faith that we took in trusting in you. So we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.